Noted. I just tuned in <laughs> and Dan said something about in the middle of a frat party. Well, you had to be there. There was excitement back here. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of talking at frat parties. I will not talk anymore. <laughs> it was so funny. It was so mm -hmm. quiet. Some talking is good. After the first um, so uh, the challenging bit is um, our bathymetry, the map, the green colored map with all the black lines on it is uh, that's like 100 meter resolution, right? It's the, the macro and uh, we're dealing with, you know, 30, 30 meters maximum. And uh, so we don't really know what we're going to uh, see till we see it. So I see these colored things on my uh, sonar, and that, but that you know, is also pretty uh, gross or macro until we actually get there and we can see and see the relief in Atlanta, what the rocks are doing, um, and because it's vertical, so to to be able to move through and. Um, be in a position with both vehicles to get good imagery and uh, be uh, favorable heading. So typically we want Hercules facing into the current so we don't, you know, get blown into the cliff or so we don't have to thrust to stay off the cliff, which will disrupt the visibility and I'll have less control of the vehicle also. So for example, now we're in a sweet spot, I can let go of the controls and nothing happens, you know, the vehicle pretty much stays where it is. Uh, if you're riding down the road on a motorcycle and you let go of the handlebars while you're in a tight turn, you know, it's not going to have a good result. But if you're going down straight road, you can probably, or a bicycle, same, but probably better analogy. Anyways, uh, to manage all that is uh, we kind of make it up as we go, I guess, for lack of a better word. And uh, to do all that and get some good imagery for the scientists to be able to uh, have any useful images and video is it's a bit of a dance. So, Well, it's appreciated. Yeah, that's what we do. We love it. It's particularly uh, challenging when it's also, you know, you know like wa walking around in a museum. Uh, there's some of these animals are thousands of years old. It's it, and we're inches away from them. So. So when you're going down a straight road on your motorcycle, do you let your hands go? <laughs> Well, I, <laughs> that wasn't a good analogy. I ride my bicycle across the parking lot with, you know, yeah. soda in one hand and cell phone in the other. <laughs> Our kids don't do this at home, but, you know. Yeah, your lawyer might advise you not to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> when I go through the drive through and get my Big Mac and my fries and my soda, <laughs> I'm not always parked while I'm eating it. I'm good for five. Uh, yeah, Roger. Yeah, we're definitely seeing quite some variation in the colony morphology for the bamboo corals. So I'm sure we have good still images and I can check them in the morning. So I'm looking at the dive plan and it looks like the, you know, the descent location is at uh, 2,665 meters. We're at about 2,372 meters now, and the profile looks about the same on this leg up to waypoint two. So that means this steep descent has been continuing for about a thousand feet up. Yeah, it's always it interesting with our multi-beam. You know, it's looking straight down when it's getting the imagery right. Yep. 
we are s uh, we are seeing some beautiful percentages again uh, and the sea star that we saw feeding on the bamboo coral a while back i'm sure was a sorciasta uh are we in a position to zoom in on any colonies yeah, yeah. okay uh then probably these any of these uh and the yeah the pinkish color the smaller fans yeah go ahead there's a small uh pseudo anthomastis uh recruit on the rock Yes, that's that's good. Yeah, they, those look like hemicorallia with a bunch of uh, ophiroids. We have some bamboo coral colonies, but I'm definitely seeing some which are a little bit yellow. Okay, you can go ahead. So. And previously, we were seeing some things, some bamboo corals, which had a more pinkish tinge to the. I'm really missing my, uh, <coughs> for a while we had a much better camera on the front of the vehicle looking down so I could zoom in on that one and oh, okay. monitor on this one, but now I'm, we just have that, you know, I have a very limited mm -hmm. uh, image there to hold station. So I, when, some when you zoom in, I'm trying to look at that and not the zoom one. Mm. And just in general, if the boat is not moving, like if Atalanta's not moving, it's you know, we can if everything's static, then I can m much more comfortable uh, zooming in because I can basically let go of the controls and we can do a zoom and the ROV stays where it's supposed to. If Atalanta is moving, it drags it around. <coughs> You want to see, uh, sorry, you circled something there and I was... Uh, yes, so um, these fans at the back, I'm not sure if we can zoom in on them from where we are. I can try and come around here and see them. The one which has the white squat lobster, the munidopsis, sitting on it. Right. There's a Chrysogorgia at the base. Lost the pot, Elsie. Is it this one here in front of us? Is it this one? Oh, that one. Roger. Sorry, I was muted. Okay, Jenna, I can push in there for us. Uh, sorry, I'll turn on the down lights too. That's Those look like primnoids to me. Yeah, I would say they're primnoid. That's a primnoid colony, and that's a fairly big one. Yeah, thank you so much. And Let's see, we get a shot of the. Uh, Squatty while we're in here. Oh, the there's the munidopsis. The squat lobster. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, 
And there's another one of those psychocalyx glass sponges in the back. I'm surprised every seamount has been fairly different. Yeah. yeah. You know, this tells us about the, this tells us that how like the previous, uh, earlier the concept was that the deep sea is a very homogeneous environment and that there's rarely anything found in the deep sea and even when it is, it's evenly distributed across oceans and the more we explore such areas, we realize that how wrong that was because we have been, these seamounts are fairly close to one another and even between them we are seeing such great differences in uh, diversity and uh, community compositions. So this is wonderful. Good for fun. Are you letting me stay? I come up a few meters. Eh? To get the tether up here. Yeah. yeah. Push over to the far wall here, so it should help. Yep. We are in a position to collect. Yeah. Mm, so there is a request uh, in the chat uh, to collect the last coral that we were zooming in on this one, uh, which had the squat lobster on it. If you have moved farther away from it, we can always collect when we see it again. The right. large primnoid fan with the squat lobster. Right. So it doesn't have to be that one, but no, yeah. but something like We've seen that. many of them, yeah. Yes, uh, not a lot. We were seeing them pre earlier in the dive, and then in between we d weren't seeing them for a while. But mm. I'm sure we'll see more primnoid fans. Well, it's right there, so. Um. I don't know if there's anything to set down on. Or Bio box sample or uh, snip and slurp? A uh, snip and slurp. Right? Yeah, well, whatever would be easier in this maneuverable situation. I know you don't have any place to yeah. rest, yeah. so um, whatever would be faster and convenient. Easier. Yes. And if it's not simple, then we can move on. We'll see more. There yeah. actually is a little place to uh, touch the porch there, maybe. <coughs> Touching the porch. Put a toe out, as we can say. Just a bit. What's that? You want the porch out? Uh, no. Come down five for me. Come down five. And then if we can get a zoom whenever is a good time. Yeah, I'll see if we can get hurt to uh, find a happy spot here. Yeah, I see him. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
Down five. And Upasana just confirming those red things on the corner of the screen. Are those spruce inches? Or, okay, so, awesome. See what that squat lobster is up to. Zoom right in on him. <laughs> I guess they can be completely white. How big a piece are we talking about here? 10 centimeters? Yeah, 10 centimeters will suffice. Yes, Roger. absolutely 10 centimeters. Um, and Good. yeah, that's great. That falls in there, is it, Jaina? You. <laughs> <laughs> be in your dreams tonight. Okay, can I uh, go away for me? Are you slurping this or are you putting it in a sandwich? Tell him to it, Herc. Tell him to it. Moving the manipulator painfully slow so don't steal our flow and Okay, uh, push in for us there, please. So, uh, no single branch I can get there. Maybe, uh, yeah, maybe down here. Wow. Nice. Don't think that will go in the slurp. Yeah, we can go ahead and put that in a bio box. Um, I'm not sure if it's floaty or not. Uh, Me neither. <coughs> you didn't even disturb the lobster. Yeah. 
Great work, Dan. That was very smooth. Yes, that was a beautiful connection. You want to uh, change the... No, you already have. Look at you. Uh, Steps ahead, Dan. Sure, I like the way we're oscillating here. Have a look at that. The yellow one. This one. We yeah, after they put it in the. Sample salvo and um, open that starboard box. I can hit the sample salvo. Sorry. And the only only box that we've used so far is uh, A, and there's a rock in there. So A has a rock. And in so it's okay right. if you if you mix. Cheat and use uh, Atlanta to see what we're doing here. That's such a killer view of Atlanta, mm -hmm. putting it in there. Look at that Atlanta view, that's so interesting. So, since I don't know if he's floaty, uh, I'll be quick. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, all my verts, so we're going to start floating up. Don't panic. They should not be too floaty. Okay, close the box. It's not floaty. And that was sample 044. And in box B. Got it. Thanks, Taylor. Ann. Yes. So uh, we think that was a primnoid in the genus Paristonella, uh, but this. The species is unknown. That's a suggestive genus. And it was such a wonderful view of from the Atlanta to see Hercules put the sample in one of the bio boxes. You want me to come up? You good. Right. Thank you so much for the collection. My pleasure. That was smooth, almost like we did that before or something. Also some shout outs from our viewers. Um, saying great snip and slurp, Dan. So thank you so much. In addition to all the comments saying it was a great sample collection, um, someone was also wondering um, what goes into positioning uh, the ROV when taking a sample. I know we're still in kind of treacherous terrain here, and we're navigating that. But um, whenever you have a time, whenever you have time, feel free to um, share your thoughts. Okay, Jack, I'm gonna yeah. come up a bit here now. We do.
five. Um, and in Prashna, we had a question with uh, from good for tenant two seven zero, please. From someone who's familiar with shallow water corals, asking if they are relatives of fire corals in the deep ocean. I believe fire corals are a type of hyd hydrozoan, which is like a relative of co of um, other corals. You might think of like stony corals, right? Um, are there hydrozoans in the deep ocean? Yes, we do see some hydrozoans. Uh, we have, uh, I believe the stylasterids are hydrozoans. Uh, sorry, can we zoom in on this? Those are probably zoanthids grow overgrowing a skeleton. All right, go um, ahead, China. If a quick zoom is possible, or we can continue. Yeah, that does look like zoanthids on a bamboo coral skeleton. Yeah, it's interesting how the entire skeleton looks yellow even yeah, exactly. without the zoanthids. Exactly. That's what I'm uh, wondering. And you can see it's chipped away there at the bottom. Yeah. You can see the white the exposed white. piece. But why would some skeletons be more yellow? See, that's that colony itself with the tissue is more yellowish than the one in front. Yeah, that's a great zoom. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Why are the uh, zoanthids always interesting? Uh, zoanthids are, uh, how should I put it? So when, um, so they, so they are not the uh, fan itself, but they are growing on the fan. So yeah. some, and there are also octocorals. So sometimes it's interesting because we want to have a look at whether it is part of the colony or it, they are zoanthids which are growing on the coral. And that also tells us that it's a dead stock of a coral or alive or not. So yeah. that part is definitely dead. And it's just to confirm whether that's part of the base colony or know that we have the zoanthids which are growing on the dead stalks of the fan. And zoanthids itself are an understudied group, so it's very difficult to identify them. So having good image data is always helpful for zoanthids. Most of us, we can just identify them as zoanthids, but nothing beyond that. Uh, sorry, Kara, for to answer your question previously. Uh, it's also interesting that sorry that f in the same colony some of the branches are more yellow than the other. Yeah. Famous Hawaiian zoanthid, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so we do have relatives of the fire corals if they are the hydrozoans. Uh, we have the stylasters and uh, some of the other uh, stocked hydrozoans as well. I think we saw one the other day. So we do have. Uh, several relatives in the deep sea but we haven't seen any of them today in this particular dive but uh in the large in the last one we were definitely seeing more of them cool thank you so much Hipashna. Mm -hmm. so this yellow coloration on this coral is what um you've been curious about exactly uh I'm not sure if that is a kind of a bamboo coral or something is imparting that yellow color because if you see the branches in front they are much whiter uh, but from this but we are we are unable to determine whether the yellow branches are arising from a different base that means it's a different colony or it's just that some branches in the same colony so, uh, are have a yellow color which doesn't make sense that why would that happen It really looks like bamboo in yeah. this shot with the yellow color. We can see some zoanthids growing on the uh, thinner bamboo coral stalk, and there's an ophiroid circling it. And def there are definitely some uh, 
hyped results, the ones that are growing in the back. I think they are hyped results. Oh, wow, that's great. Yeah. Even the white ones are the zoanthids. The, the zoanthids are hexacorals. Those are all. Can, can we zoom out a little bit so that we can look at the white polyps? Yes. What's happening there? Yeah, that's like white zoanthids growing on the um, bamboo coral stalks on the right. And what is that curling on the stem? That doesn't look like an ophiroid. The Yeah, I'm not sure what those are. They definitely are not ophiroids. Some kind of worm? Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Definitely some kind of a worm, some kind of... Yeah, look like... Yeah, they look like... Yeah, they're solanogasters, or apricophorans. Absolutely. Yes, they are aplicophorans. Is that a type of worm? Uh, not a, not technically a worm because they are mollusks. Oh wow! So they are the aplicophora, the solanogasters. Oh, aplacophora. Yeah. Okay. okay. So for our viewers, um, these pink curled up things are actually mollusks. So they're in the same family that uh, many other invertebrates like clams, um, the octopus, um, lots and lots of squishy organisms are in that family. So mm. pretty amazing. Titans as well. So all the mol mollusks are um they have shells, right? External or internal. So the aplicophorans, or that was the, that's what they were formerly called. Now they are solanogasters. So they do not have any shells. They have lost their uh, shells secondarily. It's fantastic. We good? Mm hmm. It's beautiful, two solanogasters in the same frame, that is definitely. Thank you. It's good. Okay. Great. Um. So you said their name was recently updated to Solano Gaster? Uh, I don't think that's very recent, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, they're in the class on Solano Gastris. Uh, I remember when we were in school, middle school, it would be Aplicophora. So I don't know exactly when that transition happened. Yeah, I was going to say, I first learned about them as a black yeah. before, and I was so excited. I was like, oh my gosh, we finally saw yeah. one. <laughs> the uh, big fans that uh, we have been seeing of the bamboo corals can be in the genus Keratoisis. And they also seem to have a characteristic yellowish shade to them. Uh, but I can confirm better during on. I, I'll have better information. I should have better information. Oh, okay. During our next. Um, Steve also just showed up, so oh. I might be able to help. Yeah. <laughs> they look like Keratoisis. Echnomyces, we may have seen some, but I am. Yeah, Echnomyces are deep. We could have seen these as well, but we have good images, so that's the 
plus my game plan here for identifying the bamboo corals is that I'll send my advisor, Dr. Scott Franz, the images because his life's work has been largely on bamboo corals and I'll get try to get his opinion on the IDs. Thank you. But they're between, uh, because we were seeing internodal branching, that means the branches were rising in between the nodes, the dark, uh, uh, the darker part of the skeleton, the proteinaceous part. Okay, so given five, that, it looks like it could be echnomyces or the keratoisis. But I'm still baffled about the white and yellow color duality sometimes in the same. Or maybe there are two different kinds that are growing next to each other, giving the... Wow, what a pinnacle. Mm -hmm. Oh, we are again seeing the sacrocalyx sponges. Isn't that a fly trap? Yes, that's a fly trap in anime, a hormithid. We're also seeing the similar primnoid fans that we just collected. There's something floating. No idea. Yeah. I, could I seem to have lost my chat window. Another five. Yeah, I do. And we have um, some viewers joining in that uh, just joined in on our recent um, marine archaeology dives, and now um, are uh, now we're exploring a seamount. So we had a question about why the view in the camera is more stable now. So we are we are using a different uh, ROV now, remotely operated vehicle. We're using Hercules instead of Atalanta, which we've been using for the past few dives, and um, they're actually working together. So if you look at the quad cam view. Um, we have a few different... For, uh, 10 meters. Actually, let's make it 20. Uh, yeah, whatever that direction is towards uh, 225. Two, 20 meters, 225, sorry. Yeah, we have uh, Steve in the chat, and he pointed out something very interesting. Uh, Asaka and Steve has also confirmed that those were Solanogasters that we were looking at and the interesting fact is the Solanogasters may be feeding uh, on those oanthids that were colonizing the uh, bamboo coral skeletons. So that is really interesting. This is a bamboo coral society over here. <laughs> <laughs> and they have allowed some primnoids to be there. Again, a very exclusive neighborhood. Yes, they're being more inclusive by allowing some primnoids here and there. But it's mostly bamboo corals. Those yellow ones definitely look like the keratoisis. This where all the and this kids one in live. front could be uh, ectomyces. I right. have to. This is where all the Punamo High School kids live. Right here. <laughs> this community for sure just yeah thanks for putting that out Kara you're right if viewers look at the, the cam view that shows the ROV beneath Atalanta they'll notice that there Atalanta is bouncing up and down a bit right yeah it's because Atalanta is, holds the the long cable the main cable down from the ship and that's the ROV we used on the wreck dives Right, and it yeah. does bounce up and down. But the view, of course, from Hercules, which is free swimming and tethered to Atalanta, is much more stable. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for joining in from our uh, previous dives and to our current dive. And thanks, Hans, for that additional explanation. Uh, come down five formula. The view from that camera, I forget what it's called. That's also very beautiful. The Atlanta's view? No, the bottom one, which is looking uh, from beneath Hercules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the view from Atlanta is 
magnificent. It just gives you an idea where we are and how the scale. Yeah. Yeah, the I'm scale. regretting not putting one of the uh, sexton cameras on there looking down. It would be just absolutely breathtaking because mm -hmm. they are a much better camera. You can see, you know, 10, 20 meters straight down in front of the ROV. What would it take oh, to 10, do something like meters. that That's for on Hercules? Would that be possible? or What's that? Would that be possible to replace that camera system with something like the Sexton? Or yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah. There's a couple of them sitting on uh, Little Hercules right now. Oh, oh, okay. Is that the Triclops thing? That we yeah. Do? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah, that sounds cool. So 10, 20 meters of view, depth of field is great. We kind of had our hands full with some other uh, maintenance items, so we didn't take the time to play with cameras. Dan, as somebody who's been on the most cruises in this room, would you say that this is pretty What's rare? What's and that? As somebody who's been on the most cruises in this room, um, would you say this is a rare um, abundance and for especially how long we've been going? Yeah, for this deep, that's uh, pretty spectacular. It's right up there in the top 10 for sure. Oh, wow. Wow. This rock face is definitely uh, dominated by the bamboo corals. So even within the last couple of hours, we have seen a gradual change in community composition, even though the overall diversity remains similar, but here it's dominated by the bamboo corals, whereas previously uh, there were more hemichoradium and primnoid colonies that we were looking at initially. It's very interesting. Mm. Yeah, I've noticed that the bamboo corals seem to be able to occupy this very flat top space yeah. that the other corals were more hanging on the sides. Exactly. Uh, the wedges. And I think because of their the size, maybe. size yeah. and the shape, it allows mm -hmm. them to grow in different directions. They can balance out and stuff. Um, and also the height that bamboo corals can attain. Probably that is an advantage given the position of this rock face or the direction. We're not seeing so many of the chrysogorgids anymore. They are there, but... The bathymetry has been pretty interesting on this dive too. It's uh, the amount of pinnacles like this. Or mm -hmm kind of uncommon. A lot of times we see, um, you know, we get a good peninsula, if you will, yes. that we follow for a while, but to have these freestanding ones is... Yeah, that is actually a very good way to describe it. Stacks. <laughs> this is what, the second or third one like this? So. What causes that patterning in the sonar? Yeah, the dots and... Huh. Oh. Uh, it could be some uh, harmonic of one of the other half a dozen devices on the vehicle that are emitting. Hmm. Sound waves. Uh, sometimes we get a little. Uh, our uh, USBL is auto magic digital changes uh, frequency to make itself happy. Well, that's a great shot. Maybe this abundance will be reflected in the name 
ultimately. I hope so. I hope so. That was kind of my line of thinking when I had previously asked the question. But yeah, everything here is like very big and beautiful. And yeah, especially the size. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can see the sizes in comparison to Hercules. Come up uh, five for me. Hercules in the light. We're, uh, Kind of waiting for the boat to catch up now. We'll run away the next uh, targets. Roger. 20 meters away. Gonna have to come up a bit, Jacob, to clear that pinnacle there. Some more, I think. Clearing it. Did myself. That how those mm -hmm. little crev in those even little crevices we are seeing more sponges and certain kinds of corals. So there is definitely a uh, a difference in the nutrients brought uh, brought in by the water and in the different parts of the same within like a couple of meters of each other. Micro environments. Micro environments exactly. Absolutely niches that are determining the diversity of those places. It's been a wonderful dive. That's good. Yeah, it has been. Niche microenvironments. Yeah, I did. Pretty good for 312 in the morning. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. We cannot ask for anything better. Uh, when he's ready, we're ready for uh, 20 meters on your uh, waypoint heading. 265, I think it is. And A couple of dives ago, I think we were discussing about why we see more of red, pink, and orange colors at this depth and not so much of the other colors. And uh, one of the reasons that I had forgotten at that time, I read about it later and it came up in a discussion with my advisor, uh, was that blue light penetrates the deepest in water and red light penetrates the least. So if things were more of the, so if it, they are red or in the spectrum of red, it is an advantage because they will not be seen. We are seeing them because we are shining light on them. Right. But if they were in the bluer range of colors, then they would be more visible. And even though there is no light, other organisms, fishes and more predatory and mobile organisms, they have very highly sensitive sensory organisms where they form not, they don't see things as we do, but they still can see things in the other spectrum of energy. It's not just visible light that's everywhere there. Right. And even in the shallower depths. So there's an advantage to being in this color range than being in blue or yeah. the yeah, others. I've seen that. Red becomes black. Exactly. Red becomes black, so you, they Every will just m blend in the environment and will not be... Every time See. I've been cut underwater or bit, mm -hmm. it's black. <laughs> so it's, it's. I think I, I have probably said this a hundred times and I'll continue saying this, is it baffles me how every little thing has a interesting reason behind it in nature, wherever we are looking at, be it the deep sea, be it terrestrial, be it around us. Every little pattern has a well thought out reason. And yeah, all I agree. Uh, yeah. And every time I've been bit, there was a very good reason. <laughs> exactly. 
And again, there is if some, and sometimes if there is no disadvantage in retaining the color, they don't. Evolutionally, there is no advantage in losing it, so they'll retain the colors. Uh, mm -hmm. Come down by mm -hmm. And biochemical factors, and also what they're feeding on. Let's see right. if you can find that pinnacle. Because they take the. Um, I'm joking. Just come down five. I'm blanking out on the word. The. Uh, I think you're past it. Pigments, the pigment molecules from what they're feeding. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I think that's why there's so much um, interest, especially in like. Um, um, natural product discovery, mm -hmm. so like down, chemicals take up, down, down, down. derived yeah. from our environment. Sorry, exactly. sorry, sorry. Need more leash. Oopsie. Yeah, that's good there. You can see the pinnacle. You're good there. Okay. Roger. Are auto heading's okay. It's auto XY. That we have some euplectated sponges in our view. Yeah, right on top of that pinnacle. There's a primnoid fan, the hemichorallium. Yeah, we see some chat about the geology, and um, yeah. Val did say she was seeing the, you know, the, the dikes, the intrusive lava that, sh that are translated into these vertical stacks. And um, this area is good for rock collection. I think we want to get to a waypoint two, and then we'll get a rock. Those are instructions from Val. Okay. We want a rock from here somewhere? Well, there's interest in the, the chat on shore, and how close are we to waypoint two? Maybe this is a good spot. We're not that close. We still have quite a bit of, let me, uh, give me a second. We have just under 400 meters. Roger. Should we try to move towards waypoint two and then yeah, uh, get a piece of rock? How We've only moved 133 meters, roughly. Just for reference. Mm -hmm. I can. I can hear you. Well, we started out at 2,500 meters. Started the watch at 2,500 meters, so we've come up several hundred meters. Yeah. How many rock samples do we have? Not One so far. On and off, we're really light. Yeah, and I think the. Uh, in the recommendations were every every thousand meters, every kilometer, a thousand meters. So we haven't moved much far. Yeah, we moved vertically yeah. a bit, but horizontally, or as the crow flies, as they say, we haven't we haven't crossed much That's difference. To to. Crow wouldn't be flying. That's probably a problem. Unless you hit the wall. Oh, okay. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't look. That's fine. I'm going to try and slide to the north here for a while and see if I can uh, get on the other wall there. All right, I think we need to move a little more before we start taking another sample for the rocks. Heleon, as they say in Hawaii.
a ship move going on? We're just finishing one. Roger. And for our new viewers tuning in from Finland, Estonia, Denmark, um, Puerto Rico, Poland, Russia, Singapore, um, thank you so much for joining us. We are currently on an unnamed sea mount in Papahanaumo Kuakea Marine National Monument. Um, and this area so far has been really remarkable and striking in that it has a large amount of corals and the corals themselves are very large and um, just have grown to an incredible size. So um, a really amazing place that we currently are in. Papa Hanamo Kuakea uh, is the largest marine protected area in the United States and um, Box Canyon. it's very culturally and historically significant and a sacred space for native Hawaiians. So we're very grateful to be uh, able to explore these places um, and share that exploration with you. If you have any questions, feel free please feel free to head to nautiluslive.org and enter them into the chat box and we'll try to get to them when we can. See, that to me looks like an intrusive magma dike, that formation on the, on the right yeah, that's vertically, really but... Exactly. You know, I'm not a geologist. I only had a class about 50,000 years ago. That is, I was about to comment that looks so interesting geologically given the how pieces of rocks are, because I don't have better words for them, yeah. are extending out horizontally and forming like a balcony-like structure. And then yeah. we have these uh, columnar ten, please. structures which definitely look like Lava flow. Well, well, Another they were lava flows at some point in time. If you look, and overhanging those balconies are the various glass sponges. Hmm. What is that? Is that a crinoid or an anthomastus on a s something? That's again another very beautiful big sarcogalax. Stocked euplectelid. It's also interesting to note how the uh, fans are changing their direction of growth depending on uh, the position of the yeah. rock faces. Here, yeah, that is another pseudoanthomastus. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's okay. Good. Yeah, we can continue. We can go away, thanks. And with a bunch of hydroids growing on its sides. Do you think you could expand on that a little bit more, Hans, what you just mentioned for viewers who are maybe not as familiar with geology? Um, intrusive rocks versus extrusive, I believe one is formed on the surface. Uh, yes, I'd be one of those viewers who are not very familiar <laughs> with geology, Come by the way. From you. <laughs> Gotcha. Uh, but I had, you know, some some courses at UC Berkeley. <laughs> you just sounded so convincing. <laughs> <and> <laughs> <years> so uh, <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a problem I have. Um, but uh, you know, yeah. Intrusive vertical uh, w w when lava comes up through rock, finding a fissure sure. and forming uh, a dike or column you know, okay. headed for the surface through great pressure, then solidifies. Then what happens is the the outer rocks can be eroded away or broken away, and then you can see that column, that separate column inside the, the igneous rock. And I could be totally wrong because 
it was a long time ago. Oh no, you're absolutely right. Entry level geology courses. Yeah. Yes, you're absolutely right. So extrusive rocks are when the magma uh, has flown out, flown out of yeah. the crust and has solidified, and intrusive is when it's solidifying within the uh, crust. Awesome. I didn't know this. I looked it up. <laughs> I'm relieved. <laughs> I had a couple of geology classes as a part of my master's program, and I really enjoyed the the plate tectonics portions of it. Oh, yeah. Uh, I can't say the same for all the other parts of geology, but that was the <laughs> part that I enjoyed the most. Uh, Hans, and well, background in general. If you look at the front page of the dive plan, mm -hmm. you can see a bit of the, uh, the difference between the west and east side. Um, and if you remind me, if you remind me later, I'll show you the the multi beam data. Yes, it was very striking when it came in. Mm -hmm. The west side was pretty it seemed pretty smooth. Okay. The east side it was almost like it looked like things collapsed. So, I mean, I don't know how else to just describe it. It is this curvature. You're right. That kind of look striking for a seamount. Do we know much about the geologic history of the seamount or that is part of something that we are exploring and trying to find out? I think that's a valid question. Yes, Kay. that's right. <laughs> she would use big words to explain it. <laughs> but when I see volcanic forms like this, I mean, just having lived in Hawaii, yes. where Hawaiian one five. side is, you know, smoother, mm -hmm. less steep, another side is very steep and semicircular. Mm -hmm something comes to my mind a caldera a small caldera which half of it has broken away okay and you know the other half is kind of this semicircular shape that's very steep okay yeah these semicircular shapes are very striking but it's very much just a guess caldera uh, i think we're good for another tent there's a large tuberculosis. And for our viewers wanting to learn more about geology, uh, Dr. Val will be on um, from 8 to 12. Um, so there'll be a lot more geology um, expertise, and you can ask your questions there um, uh, in the 8 to 12 watch. We are seeing some wonderful eupleptalids and the uh, bamboo coral colonies. Uh, there are some ophiroids uh, on those uh, bamboo coral colonies uh, that we are currently seeing. There have been there were some uh, hemicoralliums as well. Yeah. Up five, please. As we continue to move along the slope. Yeah, when Val or Hannah get back on watch, they'll be much more suited to answer questions about geology and structure and uh, Top five. the internal workings right. of these seamounts and undersea volcanoes. camera a little bit. Tilt up. Tilt up, more up. Yeah, I don't see the, why don't I see the Atlanta camera in the, the Atlanta camera. Oh, okay, I see, I see, I see. Just trying to work something out. Um, 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 um.
Oh, yeah, it can come up five. Coming up five. Thirty minutes to go in the middle watch. Yeah, I just noticed there's only thirty minutes left in our watch. Yep, that for sailors that would be seven bells into the middle watch. <laughs> yeah, and I have a ship to shore with my hometown at four. So, oh. if either of you want to join in, let me know. Absolutely. Go ahead, sorry. No, no, sorry, you go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I was going to, Derek might pop in 10 minutes early. Okay, okay. Yeah, we have, again, we're again seeing, seeing some beautiful recentids on the bamboo corals, and we see some magnificent uh, and large uh, bamboo right, coral colonies. For, uh, definitely of two different kinds. The um, Yes, please. And there's some hemichorallium, the sacrogallic uh, euplectelid glass sponges. There's a primnoid in the back. A couple of primnoids on both sides. And these bamboo girls are probably in the genus Echnomyces. Uh, but that needs further confirmation. One of the more... The more uh, bushy kind if I if that's that's one way to explain them would be the echnomyces. Come up five four and the more brambly one uh, definitely in the sub family Keratidae, but I don't think I know um, for plants, at least sometimes um, species hybridize as well. For plants, they have some crazy genetics, um, so they're able to do that maybe a little more easily. And I think I've heard of some shallow water coral hybrids as well. Um, is that something we've seen in the deep? Uh, yeah, I know about the shallow water corals so far in my work and uh, most of the work that I'm familiar with. Uh, such hybridization has not been seen but I if I'm not very wrong I remember reading a few papers uh, on octocorals where hybridization uh, has occurred or there was a suggestion that it may have occurred mm. uh, but uh, they were c from those corals where I forget which group they were uh, from somehow the name Paramercias come into my mind, but I can be absolutely off. But I also remember that they were deep sea corals, deep sea octocorals, definitely, but from comparatively shallower depths than what we are currently looking at. It can also be a factor of such factor uh, of the fact that we don't know a lot right. about the corals from these mm -hmm. depths. Um, if people in the chat. I'm sure they know more about this if they can contribute that. Right. I think it's just the what we were talking about earlier with species and defining what a species is, it can be really difficult. So, um, yeah, definitely sometimes they're hybridizing or you have to do genetic tests or um, it can be difficult to define. So. Yeah. Uh, so Steve Oskovich on the uh, chat also confirms that definitely it uh, there has been such events in the para seen in the Paramarsids. So, wow, cool I'm not know. completely off. My memory works. <laughs> Your memory is amazing. <laughs> oh, es no, it's not. Especially at like 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I have very poor recall memory. I'm more of a processes person.
And for a long time, we have been working just with the mitochondrial genes for these octocorals. So we may have, so because of that, even if there was a hybridization, we would be losing out on that signal. Do you so see this black cloud? Is that ink? Or is that coral? It's almost like a black cloud, like ink, oh like, you yeah. know, the squid was there. Is it on the rock? I think it's, I thought I saw it to the left, too, just floating in the water. And I think I'm seeing shadows now, so never mind. Ooh, there's a fish or something right there. Yeah, there's a, there's a fish. Definitely, that's a fish. In the office, oh, the center, yeah. it's moving. Yeah. One of the Ophidiformis. What the common of name, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, what kind of fish? Cuskeels. Oh, another Cuskeel, okay. Yeah, so, so as we are moving more towards genomic level studies, uh, we'll be getting to know more about uh, hybridization in, in octocorals, because when we are working with uh, mitochondria, mitochondrial gene, so mitochondria just has a uh, maternal inheritance, so we lose out any information about right. uh, any kind of hybridization. So there's a good and a bad side to it, but these are, uh, yeah, we'll be knowing more and more about these. And then it's a new conundrum that we'll be getting into about what's a species, what's not a species, right. what's a hybrid. But uh, so far, it's not uh, the degree of hybridization so far known is way less than in some of the plants that right, we right, right. know plants about. Right, right, Plants are crazy. They can be tetraploid, <laughs> polyploid. It, it's going to be. Yeah, polyploid. It, it goes beyond my understanding after a point. So we haven't yet encountered that mm -hmm. right. kind, that degree or, of hybridization. Maybe if this question is asked to somebody 10 years down the line, we'll probably have a different answer. But Yeah, after many more EV Nautilus expeditions. <laughs> <laughs> and we always have That's to remember right for me, so. but that a lot, of, a lot of the questions are still unanswered, even though they may be very... Uh, obvious questions for several other groups of organisms, especially terrestrial or shallow water organisms, because right. these are inaccessible to a large degree. And very recently have we started uh, getting more samples, and even then that's less in terms of. Right. So we still can't do a lot of population level studies. We will be able to do it eventually. So yes. And related to that, for when you get the eDNA um, from the water samples, and then you take that, you sequence it, and you compare it to basically a library mm -hmm. of genes that are already known. But since we have so little knowledge of what is attributed, you know, what DNA belongs to which species in the deep, is it a little hard to interpret that eDNA sometimes? Or are you able to kind of still match it to like shallow water counterparts or something like that? Uh, that is a good question. So. Uh for octocorals specifically, it, we have more data when it comes to mute S. Uh, uh, even though generally COX-1 is the more commonly used barcode gene, because uh, in octocorals, so mute S is a gene that is found in every metazoan, so every organism that we have, multicellular organism, but they are found in the, I think we'll follow the nuclear wall genome. Here. So octocorals are the only ones where. Uh, they they also have the nuclear counterpart, but they have a mitochondrial copy of that gene, or I should use the word copy, but a mitochondrial version. And this mute S is uh, supposed to have a mutation repair function, so it reduces the rate of mutation, or it reduces the degree of mutation that we see in the mitochondrial genome in comparison to other organisms. So COX-1 is not that phylogenetically informative, where but mutase itself is highly, is more variable than uh, COX-1 uh, and more to 25 for me. So we have lot, lots more of mutase data for octocorals, if not for every species. We have a good database for mutase because octocorals also have been worked on for a long two time. 225? 
and we have samples in museums which have been collected during troll troll samples and did, even yeah. if not for all the species yet for certain groups we'll we have more data available more than the others the within the, the west but we definitely have for all the families and i would right, assume uh, so far i know for most of the genera as well so and a lot of work is also going on in creating those libraries at least for mutes so we can at least get it down to a family level uh, and I'm sure to a genus level, but there may be right here. some genera for which we don't have mutas data yet, but there's an effort to create that, but definitely for the family and genus level, I'm sure that we have for everything, Not if, if not for all the species, and it's very difficult to sometimes identify them to the species, that's you, why. You did get wow. some rest today. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Very cool to know this. Actually not. <laughs> Very cool to know there's that library. And yeah. uh, we're just helping you prepare for your thesis defense for <laughs> all the questions that you'll have. Okay. <laughs> That's another book. <laughs> oh, that's a good shot. That is a beautiful shot. What are those? Uh, are those sponges that kind of look like woven glass? Yeah, those, are, those would be the euplectelids. Yeah, the glass sponges still. with the shrimp inside. Mm -hmm. I don't think all Euplect, I'm not sure. I, I'm definitely some in the genus Euplectella have those associated shrimps. They may not be associated with all the different kinds of Euplectella. Do you know why they do that? Are they trapped inside or do they prefer it? They prefer it. Uh, they're not trapped because it's found in all individuals of that of those genera or ge of, of those species of Euplectella genus. There has to be some. So it's it's a mutualistic interaction between uh, the shrimp and the sponge. Is this the coral that Asaka wanted to zoom on? The white colon. It looks like axis with um, the darker polyps, but this one and this one. The lower one. This one? Yeah. Yeah, we can have a look at that, the, if possible. Um, yeah. Not too sure what species this is. Probably a prognoid. Probably a prognoid. And how uniform the... Push in there. Turn up. I would say a prunoid, probably in the, probably the Calyptrophora, para, Calyptrophora. Okay, go in. Oh, this is a hemichorallium. I'm so sorry. Yes, Steve chimed in that that's a hemichorallium. Oh. I always associate associate much thicker branches with hemichorallium. This is apparently a very fine branched hemichorallium. I think the jury's out on this one. Yeah. <laughs> According to the chat. Uh, to me, it looked like a... I guess a hemichorallium, but yeah. was very, very fine and yeah. uh, white color. <laughs> Tina said, you're kidding. I am not part of this. <laughs> I don't think it's a chrysogorgia, but yeah. I am not sure. Chrysogorgias are usually finer. Finer, the polyps didn't and look axis, much chrysogorgia. So. Yeah. Yeah, it looked, uh, yeah, it was thicker and the polyps looked different from the chrysogorgian polyps. Uh, 
It's another beautiful bamboo coral, which... names so the clades haven't been given any um, yeah so they're they're assigned certain uh, tags in that way because there's still a lot of it's going on papers are being published it's been worked on so I think the work is done because it had to be like uh, can I come up with it? series of papers before they could come What's to that? it I get that so tether I think in they my face just I can published come up with a it? third in the series I still don't hear it I have that tether in my face. Can I come up a bit? No, I'm going to come down here and go right. see if I can get on the more westerly wall there. So it's mostly by... These were assigned by Dr. Scott France and... There's a whip. Yeah, these are all bamboos. Those that hemi coral, yeah. yeah. The corridor. Did we see a squid? What was it? I looked away for I a second. I think it was just a hitchhiker from Piece okay. of coral earlier. or something. Yeah. Okay. What is that dark thing in the sediment there? To the right. lower left. 20 meters. Uh, yeah, it's off of screen now. Um, Where do we want to go here? What? 225. Safe. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Derek. Thank you, everyone. See you on our next watch. All right, great. Thanks, Mia. Thanks, Mia. Um, I'm also going to jump off to help Mia with her ship to shore call. Um, so it's been a great watch with you all, looking at this really amazing coral. Um, and um, hopefully we'll have some more amazing seamount dives coming up in the next uh, couple weeks remaining of the Ala Al Moana Kaiuhi expedition. Yeah, those uh, would be some uh, Thank you, Kara. Yeah, tall. I'll pass it off to Elsie. Thank you all. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks. Have a good interaction. <laughs> yeah, we are nearing the end of, uh, almost the end of our watch. We have... Uh, a little over 10 minutes left, and then we'll have a quick watch change. And right now we're seeing comparatively less uh, uh, turn to your left of, uh, coral colonies. Yeah, very different. Mm -hmm. Left, you want me to go? Uh, oh, never mind.
We're a little bit higher. We've come up. So now we're at almost 2,300 meters depth. Mm -hmm. I think we started around um, almost around 2,500. A little less than 2,500, but almost. You can actually turn to your right now, I think. Finally getting on the other wall here. Come up five. Coming up five. Roger. Up five. I think we see a small uh, pseudoanthomasis colony tucked in between the sponges. There's still a few uh, bamboo coral colonies that we keep seeing. The euplectelids, and this one does have a shrimp. You can see a pink speck yep. in it. The bamboo corals with the ophuroids. Come up five. Coming up five. See if that wall is going to go away from us or not. That was quite the bamboo ridge, though. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think these um, eupectelid sponges we're seeing are Walteria. Yeah. Which one? Yes, yes. Yeah, there's... Uh, They're rough. closed at that opening part yeah. rather than... Or at the top. At the top and are oh, a little no, fuzzy. actually open. They're just open, very small. They're more fuzzier than the mm -hmm. eupectelid in this. I think it, it's the same genus. Just yeah, the wall's getting Let's try uh, 10 no, meters in west. In comparison there. to the Euplectella. Oh. The same family? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, the wall's moving away. Roger. Yeah, it's almost four. It's like a small recent. Yeah, 10 meters, 270. And now the beautiful Sacogalyx with an Ophiroid. <laughs> Another five for me. Coming up another five. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of our viewers from all over the world. If you're just tuning in, we are currently exploring an unnamed seamount in the Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument. And this is actually the northwesternmost seamount in the monument. Uh, it has never been dove, um, okay. dove on before, All so right. this would be our first. This would be our first um, visual survey, and we are currently coming to the end of our 12 to 4 watch. 
So there might be a little bit of movement as everyone gets settled. Uh, so continue to stay tuned as we uh, explore. Yes, thank you everybody for tuning in and it has been a great dive so far and we <laughs> have seen That's right. great diversity as well as a uh, huge number of corals are an extremely large and wonderful, splendid, big colonies. So it has been a great dive so far and it's time for a watch change. Yep. Thank you, watch. Thank you, front row. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Up five, Jacob. Set the DVL to the lock it up. Good luck with that. There is no DVL at the moment. Okay. And generally headed west, but yeah. don't get wavelength fixation. Uh, yeah, I'm following my nose. There's a lot of swarm around. Uh, there's a lot of pinnacles. Mind if I reset you to uh, USBL? Yeah, you can I did a 10 meter move due west about five minutes ago, just okay. FYI. Looks like they've been mostly doing 10 meter steps up this. Yeah, that's what Dan was saying. 10 meter steps. 
Yeah, it looks like about five minutes per move, like to translate down the line. Um, so let me know when you want a new one. I think I'm ready for a move. Back row, are we ready to get going? Yeah. All right. Uh, what depth are we at now? Two, two, seven, five. Okay. Yeah, I know we're heading towards waypoint two. Um, yeah, we'll see how we do. We uh, we may, we'll see if Daniel wants to, but we might extend this dive. Uh, we have like five and a half K to go. Um, and they didn't seem to make mo all that much progress because there's a lot of cool stuff to see. Okay. Which is fine. Bridge nav. Bridge nav. Good morning. Uh, can we please do a ship move 10 meters bearing 270? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Can we hear me okay? Yep. Yeah? Awesome. All right. For our viewers, we are switching into our 4 to H watch shift, and we're all kind of getting settled in. And I don't know about y'all, but I'm very excited for this seamount dive. I cannot wait. I've been watching a little bit with the live stream between ship to shores, and it's been looking good. Um, sorry to get into this so quickly. Um, can we get a zoom in on that one of those glass sponges? The stocked ones? Yes, please. Okay. Come down just a little bit, Tito. Give me a little extra leash. Yeah, nice. Oh, we're just waiting on video for Zoom. We have no one in the seat right now. So this is as good as you get until we get someone over there. Interesting morphology. Um, we're looking for something similar, except that the sides are more smooth. For, so it's a good one, but not what we're looking for right now. Okay. Thank you. What's this one called, Sebastian? Do you know? I think this one's just a plain bolosomid. What we're looking for is called a Lysa Sino Nice. Thank you. And, it, and it's called Stalked Bell. So it kind of has like, it looks like a shape of a bell. So, and it's white or transparent, I think. It's like a slight, a wider with a light transparency to it. Mm. 
Is it a type of glass sponge or? Yes, it is. Okay. It's a type of hexaxinoid. I think we've settled in a little bit now on watch, so I think it may be a good time. All right, Ed, you can come on. Um, to start with just some introductions of just who we are, what our roles are on the ship. Thanks. Um, and I'll be honest, the question that I get I all the time. 10 meter on the right. I don't think it's on the left. Um, during interactions, I get asked all the time about what kind of stuff we eat while we're <laughs> aboard the ship and how the food is. And I always tell everyone it's like so good and uh, I look forward to every meal and there's always so many things to choose from. But I think it might be nice if we go around and when we introduce ourselves, if you could share maybe what your favorite meal is aboard the ship, like breakfast, lunch, dinner, or if you have like a uh, food that you specifically love to eat here. So I will start with introductions. Uh, my name is Tori Hunt. I am a science communicator sailing for the very first time aboard Evie Nautilus. And I am a science teacher in North Carolina. I teach high school science um, when I'm not sailing. So I may have some students at my school that are viewing and watching now. And I've got some ship to shores that we have scheduled for later. So um, super excited to be here. This dive is gonna be awesome. And my favorite meal to eat while I'm out here is definitely breakfast. And I think our watch is convenient because we get off watch and then I get to go eat breakfast before a nap. Malia, what about you? Aloha kakahiaka, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so my name is Malia Evans. I am serving as a resource monitor and educator um, on board the EV Nautilus oh, yeah. for this expedition. Um, for, oh, food. They made great food on board. We are so lucky and well fed. Um, I gotta say, probably my faves are Sunday Sundays. We get to have some ice cream. So yeah. um, always something really good to look forward to every Sunday. And that kind of helps to um, helps me remember what day it is because sometimes we just don't know. The days just kind of meld into each other. So ice cream on a Sunday. Nice. I like that. I always look forward to that. Always also helps me keep track of what day of the week it is. Yeah. Mike, what about you? Hey everyone, uh, Mike Brennan. I'm a co-lead scientist for this expedition, a maritime archaeologist with Search Inc. Um, and the watch leader for the 48 watch. I would have to go with breakfast. Um, Josh, I'm a little low to go down much more. Uh, I've got some stuff seven meters kind of in front of me. So right. I think we need to adjust. Um, oh no, that's Hercules sonar. Yep. Yeah, so they make these open face like melts where they um, put uh, pepperoni or salami, cheese, uh, uh, sunny side up egg, and then some sort of something else, bacon or whatever. Mm -hmm. And those are really fun. Uh, but yeah, I like the 48 watch because we get off watch, have breakfast, and then we can take a nap. Mm -hmm. Can you take a picture of it? It's a nice little routine. I love it. Yeah, keep going. Can you take a picture of this? <laughs> Yay, Hannah's already in action. Hannah, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi. Hi, I'm Hannah Parody. I am a geology, well, geology grad student at CSULB, and I am, this is my first time on the Nautilus, and I am serving on the science team, and my favorite food is, that we eat on this on this ship is probably breakfast, and specifically the crepes. I really mm -hmm. love the crepes. Um, also, the pancakes are fantastic, and also we have bread 24-7, and that is also <laughs> one of my favorite things. Hannah really um, likes the carbs, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, do you yeah. have like a specific thing that you like to put on that bread? Because I just grab it. And I just, just grab it. it. Okay. <laughs> I just grab it. I, I see people add some stuff, and I'm always curious about the method. But just plain bread is also good too. Someone I mean, uh, the other day, someone uh, had one of the crepes and had like chocolate sauce in it or something. Uh, and 
uh, rather than like cutting pieces of it, she just kind of like picked it up and put and took a bite, and it just reminded me of Will Ferrell with the spaghetti and <laughs> Elf. <laughs> I love that. Nice. Okay, so a lot of breakfast fans so far. Yeah. Sebastian, definitely. what about you? Um, expanding on your bread question, I am one of those people. Um, I put a balsamic glaze on oh. top of mine, so I feel like I'm eating in Italy every morning, <laughs> even though it's like not really balsamic. Um, <laughs> but anyways, I'm Sebastian Martinez. I am an undergraduate researcher at University of Hawaii at Manoa, specifically the Deep Sea Fish Ecology Lab. I am a data logger on this shift, but I'm also kind of the only biologist on the shift. So you're gonna hear a lot about the life that we see from me. Um, my favorite food on board so far has been um, when they have mushrooms at breakfast. Yeah. Those have been very good and some of my favorites. Why are y'all shaking your head over there? Oh. I cannot believe he just said that. <laughs> yeah, not a, not a mushroom fan. Okay, well, I, I just a don't see fan. breakfast. I don't see mushroom as a breakfast food. Yeah. Mushroom is an any time of day food. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mushrooms in no time of day food. I support, I support Sebastian. <laughs> Mushrooms, fungi, yes. <laughs> I guess that would be on brand for you then. <laughs> You're just shaking your head. <laughs> oh, okay, front row, I, it looks like we may be a little busy. Are any of you maybe ready for an introduction? <laughs> Oh, I think you're muted. <laughs> I'm an SPL. There you go. Hi. Good morning. This is Derek Sowers. I'm the mapping manager for Ocean Exploration Trust, and I'm the navigator on the dive. My name's Jake Bonney. I'm in the hurt chair right now. Um, <clears throat> what was it? Favorite food? I love uh, the I love the cookies. Yeah, cookie know, time. If I ever get there in time for them, but. They, they go fast. Yeah, that's a nice treat, nice treat like right before I watch, but yeah. then there's like an awkward kind of like hour in between. There's a mad dash for the cookies. Yeah. Hey, this is uh, Tito Calacious in the front row driving Adelante today. I think uh, I'm just going to keep putting moves in. Yep, yeah, keep going. Yep. And my favorite breakfast is uh, the fruit. Mm -hmm. uh, you always have fresh fruit, and that's really nice. Yes, I like that uh, This is Ed McNichol over at the video position. Uh, my favorite food on board, uh, I think for sure, is the bags of famous, famous chocolate chip cookies uh, <laughs> that I have in my stateroom. <laughs> the old Costco box, food whenever you want it. Love uh, it. Can I have a ship move, please? Uh, 10, mirror, you're hiding 10 meters, bearing 270. We, uh, <laughs> we're fortunate enough to dock at the uh, beautiful University of Hawaii Marine Facility at Nimitz and Alakava, right down the road from Costco. Yeah. So uh, there's 42 of those in a box, and I'm doing everything I can to make sure I have an empty box Ooh. by the time we get to port. Okay. I definitely, my Costco run included... As a matter of fact, hold Go on. Ahead. Our uh, well-equipped van here even has an emergency Hi. supply, just should <laughs> you end up having to work a lot. Glad I know where that is now. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, there's clip bars and crackers and cheese <laughs> down there. That's good to know. I got like a huge thing of like Fig Newtons, and oh, yeah. that's what I've been eating pretty much in the mornings before watch when I wake up hungry. So I remember somebody bragging about how much chocolate they bring along uh, early oh, on the cruise. I haven't uh, haven't got to experience that yet. Yeah, I was able to find good chocolate. You, yeah, you, it's not uncommon for us to get the big chocolate bars. Uh, I usually get the chili ones, <laughs> and then uh, we just share. But I wasn't able to find anyone. I, I went to uh, the nice Safeway uh, before I came aboard, and didn't see anything that caught my eye. Something in the water column, that, frame like, left. The water column on the left. Did you see a thing that just... What was that, Sebastian? To the left, it was swimming. Yeah, that's what I was calling out. Where'd uh, it go? Uh, I think it's gone. Uh, Looked like a little Kirby or something. There yeah. it is, I think. Yeah. Uh, polychaete. Like Looks polychaete. like a polychaete. Wow, 
Yeah, yeah definitely a poly gate. Go for zoom if you want. Yeah, sure. It looks like a centipede. Uh, yeah, it looks like. It's like. This oh is. My God. Wow. It's not it's successfully slightly, swimming in any direction. It's slightly transparent, yeah. too. That's unusual. Let me see. Let me teach you the dance of my people. <laughs> <laughs> Not me realizing the benthic water guide does not have analids. Um, wait, nope, to do. It's just hidden. Whoa. I like feel like it's moving nowhere. Like yeah, it's, it's swimming really hard, but not going yeah. anywhere. Oh, it's too early to get philosophical. <laughs> <laughs> I love the way it's moving. It's fun. I know it is fun, but give I me don't a really beat. <laughs> I don't really know where it's going. Oh, it's going. Okay. This guy, I think I have an ID. Miss Pollockit, if you please. Called Fabula Giridae. Fabulous. Fustiella. No, oh, sorry, Jake. I was really <laughs> pushing on you there. It was worth it. Wait, so. I see that it has a question mark next to the species. What, uh, so what does that mean? Usually means that they got it pretty good down for this photo, but some they don't have the exact details, but they have most of the morphology, so they can make it educated enough guess. Okay. But they probably need to collect it to know for sure, but I don't think we need to collect it in this case. Mm -hmm. Video's going to be off comms, help in the back row. Just yell if you need me. Okay. And you said, was that a worm? Kind of worm? Yes, a polychaete worm. Polychaete worm. Hmm. Is it? Um, Steve, for future reference, um, I don't think we have any restrictions on collecting. Polychaetes. I just thought it was not novel, but if we think we see it again, we can collect it. If we can collect it. That'll be a fun one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If we can physically maneuver ourselves I don't to catch know something that's mobile. Catch turn that on, out of the water. Yeah, turn on the slurp and fly into it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, just grab it with Mondo. Mondo. <laughs> Do we still call the left one Mongo? Um, ISE Magnum. Oh, okay. Uh, like Mung Is Mongo not in existence anymore? Uh, it's the same arm. We're just being more sensitive uh, to good? You pick up the pace? Uh, language. Uh, yeah, okay. We can pick up the pace, I think. 15? Yeah, do 15. Bridge nav. Ship move, please. One five meters, bearing two seven six. Thank you. So one exciting thing. Can about we get a zoom in on the middle of this <laughs> yellow coral? Sorry to cut you off, Anna. It's sure. okay. That was funny. <laughs> No, you cannot. <laughs> I was just going to say that <laughs> this seamount has never been looked at up closely right, before. Zoom. Or at all. Or at all. It hadn't yeah. been mapped. No. <laughs> How do seamounts get names? That's a great question. Miss Malia, do you have an answer? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what are we looking at here? This, this is this a bamboo coral. coral. Right here. Well, currently, um, we have a naming process um, in Papahanaumokuakea that our Native Hawaiian Cultural Working Group um, has been really instrumental in, in developing Hawaiian names right, thank you guys. For, yeah. for many of thank the um, unnamed seamounts. And so that is a very deep process that they undergo. They look at you know, multiple characteristics, 
depth, um, you know, what's going on in the ecosystem, um, what are some of the associations with um, oral narratives, um, the history that we have in our um, Kanako Oivi Mo'olelo. And so it's a really um, in-depth, time-consuming process that the Native Hawaiian educators and scholars and scientists sit down with the different researchers, which will probably be those on board with us. And um, kind of just really, because naming is powerful. Names are powerful, um, well, at least in Hawaiian culture. And so um, to give a name is to give mana. It, you bring life to it. And so it's a really well thought out process. And we're so happy that we have these group of people who volunteer their time. Um, they're not getting paid. And so um, just so grateful for them for the things that they do. So they not only name the sea mounts, but they also name new species um, of all animal organism life in the water, you know, those that are birds, different marine algae. So it's a really, um, really time depth, you know, in regards to that process. Thanks for asking, Hannah. Oh, because Miss Molly, I remember when we were going over the names of my sea mounts and then it was, it was, was it the ha 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 what, what was that the one to mean to be strong or ha ha means to like stand proudly stand proudly and to then stand there was proudly. Uh -huh. the ho o i kai ka ho o i kai ka and is that that's to be strong yes, yes. so action it's a verb like ho mm. is to to it's an action so ho'o'i kaika is to, to emanate the strength. Mm -hmm. And so on, so my seamount that was called that was actually the samples that were a part of it had the most abundant amphibles, which I use for, date, for determining the ages of these rocks. And there was just a huge amount of them. And a lot of them were unaltered, which is That's very- That's Hercules right there. Very, right uncom Hercules, like, left very side uncommon side to see in a yep. in a steam mount. So when she told me that, I I I had a oh my gosh moment. Like I totally see how the name can give it so much power because I was blown away. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's good to know. Good correlations you're making there. Mm -hmm. Love it. <laughs> so yes, and I told you that I actually have one steam mount that is unnamed, mm -hmm. and so I can't wait until guys name it yes Good. yep that's always good you know we need to make sure that you know places that are in indigenous spaces like hawaii that um, native hawaiians take the lead you know on those processes because they have the most intimate connections genealogically spiritually um, emotionally to these places mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so hannah how did you like pick the seamounts that you're studying for your research like why those ones so my advisor at Bridge, CSULB, yeah. she went on that cruise, the NA-134 mm -hmm. cruise. So she uh, already had the seamounts. One and five meters bearing 265. Mm -hmm. My seamounts are a part of a bigger project that actually Dr. Val, one of our leads, is also on. So 